I should say one more thing about theory. It's a, it's great to discover theory, but there, the, you have to lose a lot, and you may have noticed, or maybe you didn't, how much you lose. Partly, you don't notice it much because here at the university everybody's dedicated to theory, and what is, what's left out is, uh, perception cause you you use your mind not your eyes. Skill you're not supposed to have to have any particular, uh, sort of bodily kind of skills, there's a kind of mental thing, but I'm not, let's not call that skill. I'm just calling skill the way you cope with everyday stuff that you use and so forth. Intuition, it's not fair to have intuition, I mean you can have intuition, but it's not, it's not theory, it's not something that everybody has to believe until you can put it into language and argue for it. Gets rid of emotions, the body, tradition. Coral reefs are one of the most fragile, biologically complex, and diverse marine ecosystems on Earth. This ecosystem is one of the fascinating paradoxes of the biosphere. How do clear, and thus nutrient-poor, waters support such prolific and productive communities? Part of the answer lies within the tissues of the corals themselves. Symbiotic cells of algae known as zooxanthellae carry out photosynthesis using the metabolic wastes of the coral thereby producing food for themselves, for their corals, hosts, and even for other members of the reef community. This symbiotic process allows organisms in the reef community to use sparse nutrient resources efficiently. Unfortunately for coral reefs, however, a variety of human activities are causing worldwide degradation of shallow marine habitats by adding nutrients to the water. Agriculture, slash and burn land clearing, sewage disposal and manufacturing that creates waste byproducts all increase nutrient loads in these waters. Typical symptoms of reef decline are destabilized herbivore populations and an increasing abundance of algae and filter feeding animals. Declines in reef communities are consistent with observations that nutrient input is increasing in direct proportion to growing human populations, thereby threatening reef communities sensitive to subtle changes in nutrient input to their waters. Geologists have long known that the Earth's mantle is heterogeneous. But its spatial arrangement remains unresolved is the mantle essentially layered or irregularly heterogeneous? The best evidence for the layered mantle thesis is the well-established fact that volcanic rocks found on oceanic islands, islands believed to result from mantle plumes arising from the lower mantle, are composed of material fundamentally different from that of the mid-ocean ridge system, whose source, most geologists contend, is the upper mantle. Some geologists, however, on the basis of observations concerning mantle xenoliths, argue that the mantle is not layered, but that heterogeneity is created by fluids rich in incompatible elements, elements tending toward liquid rather than solid state, percolating upward and transforming portions of the upper mantle irregularly, according to the vagaries of the fluid's pathways. We believe perhaps unimaginatively, that this debate can be resolved through further study, and that the underexplored mid ocean ridge system is the key. One of the questions of interest in the study of the evolution of spiders is whether the weaving of orb webs evolved only once or several times. About half the 35,000 known kinds of spiders make webs, a third of the web weavers make orb webs. Since most orb weavers belong either to the Aranidae or the Alliboridae families, the origin of the orb web can be determined only by ascertaining whether the families are related. Recent taxonomic analysis of individuals from both families indicates that the families evolved from different ancestors, thereby contradicting Weil's theory. This theory postulates that the families must be related, based on the assumption that complex behavior, such as web building, could evolve only once. According to Coleman, web structure is the only characteristic that suggests a relationship between families. The families differ in appearance, structure of body hair, and arrangement of eyes. Only alliborids lack venom glands. For their identification and study of characteristic features will undoubtedly answer the question of the evolution of the orb web. The study of history provides many benefits. First, we learn from the past. We may repeat mistakes, but, at least, 
we have the opportunity to avoid them. Second, history teaches us what questions to ask about the present. Contrary to some people's view, the study of history is not the memorization of names, dates, and places. It is the thoughtful examination of the forces that have shaped the courses of human life. We can examine events from the past and then draw inferences about current events. History teaches us about likely outcomes. Another benefit of the study of history is the broad range of human experience which is covered. War and peace are certainly covered as are national and international affairs. However, matters of culture, art, literature, and music, are also included in historical study. Human nature is an important part of history, emotions like passion, greed, and insecurity have influenced the shaping of world affairs. Anyone who thinks that the study of history is boring has not really studied history. The Earth's past climate including temperature and elements in the atmosphere has recently been studied by analyzing ice samples from Greenland and Antarctica. The air bubbles in the ice have shown that, over the past 160,000 years, there has been a close correlation between temperature changes and level of natural greenhouse gases carbon dioxide and methane. One recent analysis from Greenland showed that at the end of the last glacial period, when the great ice sheets began to retreat to their present position, temperatures in southern Greenland rose from 5 to 7 degrees in about 100 years. Air bubbles are not the only method of determining characteristics of the Earth's ancient climate history. Analysis of dust layers from ancient volcanic activity is another such method, as is the study of ice cores, which interpret past solar activity that may have affected our climate. I have chronic pain and at times this is severe, but this is managed with opiates. I know the general public has a very perverted view of opiates because they think street addiction, heroin, drug smugglers. However, if prescribed correctly by doctors in the right dose for your height and weight and you manage it well yourself, I haven't increased my dose of 80 milligrams of morphine in the last 18 years. So that's a fairly good illustration that no you don't double it every 10 minutes the way the general public think. And also it's very well looked after by the government. I have to present myself to my GPs who all get to know me very well every 30 days, and they have to phone to Canberra to have authorization, and I get my monthly dose of opiates to keep me going till the next lot. French and American cookbooks obviously share the same subject, they both deal with the preparation of food. But that's where the similarity ends. American recipes are very exact, while French recipes are open to personal variation. In American cookbooks, the teaspoon of sugar, for instance, is described as rounded or flat. French cookbooks are inclined to be less precise. The French cookbook writer thinks nothing of listing a sprinkling of pepper or a pinch of salt. French cookbooks are also likely to tell the reader to season according to taste. American cookbooks, in contrast, don't seem to have as much faith in their readers' ability to get the recipe right from taste. They tell readers exactly how much seasoning to use, 